All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to class this morning. Just a couple things. We are using a new mic. Um, it's portable, so uh, there we got some feedback after the Grace History Project and some other things that some folks would like to maybe be able to hear better the questions that come up that they don't always, they hadn't always come through real clear. So uh, if, you, if you ask a question, if I remember, I might hand you that and you can ask the question and for uh, audio purposes. Um, I know I probably won't remember to do that, so we'll just have to see how that goes. But anyway, I'd like to welcome everybody to class today. Uh, this is going to be the first class in something that I've titled, you can see there at the top of the page there, from this generation forever. So I want you to, if you will open up your Bibles, get uh, Psalm 12 in one hand and Psalm 138 in the other. Psalm 12 in one hand and Psalm 138 in the other. So I just want to read these verses, then we'll have a word of prayer and we'll start. Psalm 12 first. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. It says here, Psalm 12, 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the title for the class is coming out of the end of verse 7 there, where it says, From this generation forever. I actually put some stuff on Facebook a while back. Uh, asking for some suggestions about what to call the class because I had some ideas, but I couldn't. I could not. I had to. Whatever I picked, I had to locate a website, and some of the stuff I had in mind had already been taken as far as a web address. So I settled on that title, and it's coming out of that verse. And then Psalm 138, verse two. Psalm 138, verse two. I will worship toward thy holy mountain and praise the Lord for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word this morning. And we pray as we begin a class now looking into it um, in, possible, in for sure much more detail than we, we have in the past and other studies uh, in this assembly that we'll be careful to follow what the scripture says about itself and be able to apply that and what we learn from the doctrine of, of, of inspiration and preservation and other things to what we have in front of us to be able to understand and have confidence that what we hold in our hands in a King James Bible is your word for English speaking people. That everything that should be there is there, everything that shouldn't be there isn't, and that we can have trust it and have confidence that it is in fact your word for us. We're grateful for, the, for that privilege and honor to be able to have your word and study it and also obviously rightly divide it. We're grateful for this study as we start. We pray that it will bring light and understanding uh, to the saints. We're grateful for this time together in Christ's name. Amen. So there's three things I want to do here to start. And if you look at your introduction, it's not a long introduction. It just basically outlines the three points I want to cover this morning. Okay. The first point I want to cover is why this class? Why are we doing this? Why this class? Why am I going to spend time on this particular uh, subject matter? The second thing I want to share with you is some of my personal history with this issue, the, the Bible issue and the, the King James Bible versus modern versions and all that sort of thing. So I want to be able to, you to get an understanding of where I'm coming from on these things. And then last, I want to present to you a list of the, the topics and so forth that I perceive we're going to be covering uh, as we move on with things, uh, uh, as we go forward. So that's kind of what this is. This is an introduction lesson to the whole course, if you will. Um, there's not going to be a ton th this morning of real, really looking at some verses and that kind of thing. I just want to set the table for why we're going to do what we're going to do, what my history is, and then give you a list or familiarize you with some of the things that I have in mind that I want to accomplish as we start this, okay? So let's, without any delay, let's go to the first point, why this class. So since the inception of Grace Life Bible Church in the fall of 2007, I have spoken numerous times on the subject of the King James Bible. In January and February 2010, I taught a six-part study titled Final Authority, Locating God's Word in English. There's some instructions there for where to find those audios, okay, in parentheses. If you scroll down... Um, there's a, there's a page on the church website that says, Why KJV? 
If you go to that page and scroll down, you can get access to those audios from 2010. Okay? 2010 also saw the publication of my first booklet on the Bible issue, that's this one right here, uh, The Argument for Inerrancy in the King James Bible. And i got to just say, even as I look at this now, <laughs> this thing needs to be revised and expanded, okay? Because my, I, I don't necessarily disagree with what I said in 2010, but I would say that my understanding of the issue has grown and changed in the last five years. And so at some point, I hope to be able to revise this. I've kept it out there because I don't, I've looked at it three or four times since 2011, and there's nothing in it that I would say... I disagree with per se, but my understanding of that issue has changed since, 2000, uh, since 2010 when I put that together. Uh, that was followed in 2013 by this small booklet, The Apocrypha in the King James Bible, okay? And then in 2011, as part of the festivities commemorating the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, I spoke at the Great Lakes Grace Bible Conference that was in Ohio. I spoke four times that weekend on issues related to the, uh, to the King James. I talked about, actually five times, I talked about what is truth. I talked about the, the process of preservation, the, the people of preservation, the process of preservation. And then I talked also, uh, also about the, uh, rely, the language and readability of the King James Bible. Now, a lot of that information was covered in the studies I did here in 2010. And I did teach, as part of the Grace History Project, that lesson about the language and readability of the King James Bible. So the, all, those, uh, in 2011, I also taught at the Grace School of the Bible Summer Family Conference in Chicago on issues related to the King James. Specifically, the lesson there was on the inerrancy of the King James Bible. Um, I'll have more to say about this later on, but Craig and I did some significant... Uh, this had this significant discussion over a period of weeks and months um, over the issue of inerrancy and how to understand it um, properly. And there was an impetus for that, and that was David Norton's book, uh, A Textual History of the King James Bible, but I'll say more about that in a little bit. Okay? Um, in the Grace History Project, I taught a two-part study on the history of the doctrine of inerrancy in Lessons 63 and 64. And more recently, I spoke this past April 2015 at the Grace School of the Bible Pastors Conference, also in Chicago, on the subject of the Paul scenes and the preserved text. And a month later, at the Great Lakes Grace Bible Conference, I delivered a message titled, The Textual History of the English Bible. Okay? So having already taught on the King James Bible in a variety of formats and settings, I'd like to take some time to explain why I chose to do this class. Okay? So it's not like we haven't, it's not like this is a new issue that fell out of a clear blue sky. I mean, this is something that has been part of the ministry here from the beginning. Um, that a position that I've held that other um, you know, founding board members, if you will, or, or folks that were instrumental in, in uh, founding this Assembly Grace Life Bible Church have have uh, held a position regarding the English Bible, okay? And that's that the King James Bible is God's word for English-speaking people. So if you look at the next point, first and foremost, the impetus for this class was questions that I received over the year from you, the saints of Grace Life Bible Church, okay? In particular, Mike Erspommer has asked many important questions regarding a host of topics related to the King James Bible. Mike, over the years, has asked me things. Some of the things he's asked me, I couldn't answer when he asked me. And it bothered me that I couldn't answer them, so I sought out to try to find out some answers to some of the things that he was bringing up. Many of Mike's questions were involved, complex, and required further study in order to get, ans should say, get answers. In addition, there, there was never a good time to address them when we were going through the Grace History Project material. We had passed... When, when Mike started asking you some of these questions, we had passed a point in the history project where it would have been prudent to cover some of this material, okay? Because we were off on other things, and I wanted to keep going through with those things and finish those. And that's when the idea started to develop in my mind that, hey, we need to do a history project type class on the Bible issue itself, okay? And so the first, the first impetus for this was some of the questions that Mike was asking. Um, not Mike only, but others as well, but Mike's stand out most, for, uh, most foremost in my mind as things that really started to get me uh, thinking along these lines. Okay? Second, 
The Board of Grace Life Bible Church has made, a, made the training of faithful men within the assembly a top priority. Um, if you think back to our congregational meeting from last November, this, this is something that we identified as a priority and something that we wanted to put emphasis on as an assembly. Our most recent 30-part study of Right Division 101 was done with the goal of creating a basic class for dispensational instruction for those interested in being trained to labor in word and doctrine within the assembly. In addition, properly understanding the church's stance on the Bible issue is also a must for those seeking to serve in a teaching capacity. So this class will be geared to, help, geared to helping meet that important need. And then I've included the doctrinal statement of the assembly here with respect to the Bible. And I just want to read it to you. So if you look at the doctrinal statement, it says, Article 1, the statement on the Bible says, quote, We believe that the entire Bible is verbally inspired of God and is a plenary authority, and that God has providentially preserved His completed word for us today. We believe the word of God exists in its preferred, pre pre sorry, preserved form, Big difference between preferred and preserved, okay? <laughs> preserved form in what is commonly called the Textus Receptus or the Received Text. And that the King James Version is the best English translation of the Received Text available today. We believe the King James Version to be without error and disapprove of all attempts to correct the text of the King James Version with manuscript evidence or supposed understanding of the original languages. We are unashamedly literalists in our method of study and adhere to the principle God has set forth in the scriptures to rightly divide the Bible dispensationally. The literal dispensational approach is the only way to understand the differences in God's various programs and dealings with mankind since the beginning of time and plays a vital role in establishing the believer and maintaining a distinct, clear gospel message. While we believe every word of the Bible is inspired and infallible, we recognize that Paul's writings alone, Romans through Philemon, contain the revelation of the mystery that is, God's, that is God's purpose during this dispensation of grace. So the reason I read that to you is, 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 is twofold, really. First, the second paragraph demonstrates why I taught the Right Division 101 class in the way that I did. I wanted to create a class, 30 hours of study, where somebody could go through and get a panoramic or a, um, a grasp of the entire Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation uh, in it from a dispensational standpoint. Okay, What we're starting today is going to be to an attempt to address that first paragraph and set forth some things about what we believe regarding the Bible, uh, specifically the King James Bible, the doctrines of inspiration, preservation, and a lot of other things related to that, okay? So the first impetus is the questions that you folks have asked me. The second is the board's desire to train within our assembly people that are interested in laboring in word and doctrine. Not send them out, but to school them here in the assembly about what we believe about these things, okay? So any questions about points one or two? Yeah. So, if, if you want to be in a teaching capacity in this church, you have to believe that the King James Bible is without error? That's, is, that, is that what I'm meaning to say, guys? Well, I'm just asking for where, Mike, where are you talking that up? First, first paragraph, we, we believe that King James I would say that this is, this, is, this is my position, this is, the board, this is the position the board adopted, and that the saints voted on in, in the fall of 2008 as the doc approving the doctrinal statement of the church. That was when we were still at apex. Mm -hmm. there was, this, was, this document was presented to the saints and they were given an opportunity to say yay or nay after, uh, after some time to review it. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> I think you'd need more discussion on what you mean by without error. I think you would need some <laughs> discussion on why you would think it did have errors if you did. And I think if you wanted to teach here, it would just have to, it wouldn't be a black and white thing, but I think it would definitely need some discussion if, you, if somebody had a problem with the King James Bible. I think that we would certainly not, we would definitely not go for the te Bible teaching from a modern version. No, absolutely. Absolutely, we would not do that. Whether or not you had to agree every jot and tittle with that exact statement, I think, as Craig says, we would want to discuss it. But that's that's where 
that's where we're at. That's what the Saints supported in 2008 when we presented them. What happened, it's a good question. I'm glad you bring this up. When the church started in 2007, we had to go through the process of, of uh, creating uh, a doctrinal statement. We had to create a constitution. We had to create, you know, for lack of a better term, what would be the founding documents of the assembly so that everything was being done uh, the way that not only, well, mostly to appease the powers that be that were giving us a uh, um, uh, tax exemption and so forth, okay? They want to see all that stuff. Banks, uh, any institution that you're going to deal with needs to see all that stuff. So what the board did is we drafted a constitution, we drafted a doctrinal statement, and it was, it was given to the saints, and they had about three weeks to a month to review it before it was going to come to a vote. And then uh, the saints voted on it, approved it, and that's how we got to where we're at, at least as far as um, these documents. Now, uh, we're probably, you're probably going to see something further come out about this process on a different matter related to the whole same-sex marriage thing because we have to adopt a statement and add it to our statement of faith about marriage. So I just say all that was done following a certain process years ago. Okay. But I certainly would not, we would not uh, be in favor of somebody teaching from a modern version. Um, whether or not they thought that every single word was exactly inerrant. And again, as Craig says, I agree. One of the points of this class is to flush out what some of this stuff means and uh, how you should think about these things in a way that I think makes sense. Okay. And even as I read the statement, I have a lot of things where I'm like, man, do we need to... Do we need to be more clear about what we're saying here? So um, this is going to be a process of me explaining where, where I'm at and where I think it makes sense for everybody else to be. Okay. So third, I've come to believe, this is my own, now this is my own personal, private, subjective opinion. Okay. But it's an opinion that I hold that's a reason for why I think this class is important. Okay. I have come to believe, especially since the 2011 Bible conferences on the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, that a new class on the King James Bible is in order. For the record, I am not seeking to replace or cast dispersion upon what Brother Richard Jordan taught in the Manuscript Evidence class in Grace School of Bible. Brother Jordan's work has grounded many, including myself, with a clear understanding of the need for a final authority in our own language. That being said, Grace School of the Bible is now more than 30 years old. During the intermittent 30 years, the study of the historical and textual history of the King James Bible has progressed. A lot of things have happened in the last 30 years. Okay, Some new things, as we'll see in a minute, some new things have been discovered. Some new things have been uh, uh, studied and books have been written that shed a lot of light on things that were maybe cloudy in 1983 when Brother Jordan started the school. So let me be clear with you about this. There are points where I, will f I have all of his notes. I have printed transcripts of all of the notes from Manuscript Evidence class from Grace School of the Bible. There are places where I will follow what he, what he did. I will tell you that's what I'm doing. There are places where I will follow what he did and then add new information to it and tell you that's what I'm doing. There are places where I'm just going to be adding totally, completely new information that isn't found anywhere in the manuscript evidence class. Okay, So the point, my point in doing this is not to say that that was a bad class, that that class was... Um, in fact, if I'm being honest about it, I think as I think back on it now, having spent the last six months trying to prepare for what we're about to do, I really, and I really believe this, that what Brother Jordan did was a masterful collation of all the available resources up to that point to teach that class. Okay, What he did in teaching it, in my opinion, was really quite brilliant based upon all the information that he had available to him at that time. Okay. But my point is, some new things are now available, okay? Some new things are now known that were unknown in 1983-84 when he was teaching that. So when Pastor Jordan began teaching manuscript evidence in the fall of 1983, the following resources would have been, would have been available for writing the curriculum, okay? Now, I do have a disclaimer here. Note, 
This list does not claim to be an exhaustive listing of precisely the resources utilized by Brother Jordan. Rather, this list seeks to identify the major works on the subject that would have been available for him to draw from prior to the fall of 1983 when the class began. Okay? So, I know for a fact some of these he absolutely used. Some of these I think he probably used um, or was at least aware of them. So let's look at what we have here. First is Lewis Gawson, The Divine Inspiration of the Bible from 1841. I know he read this. I've talked to him about this. My sense is that his reading of this, though, was a little bit late after he had already started the class. So I think there's some things in Gawson that, and I've read Gawson over the summer, that I think are significant that we'll be, that we'll be talking about. Okay. Second is Alexander McClure, The Translators Revived from 1858. Then John William Bergen, also known as Dean Bergen, he wrote, a he wrote a bunch of books extensively on this. Uh, the Last Twelve Verses of Mark from 1871 was his first book. The Revision Revised from 1883. The Traditional Text of the Holy Gospels from 1896. And ca The Causes of Corruption of the Traditional Text of the Holy Gospels from 18, uh, 1896. Now, Bergen, we'll talk more about him specifically. We're going to survey his books at a certain point in the class. Okay, But Bergen was alive... He was a contemporary of Westcott and Hort, and he was a member of the revision committee that set out in the latter half of the 19th century to revise the English Bible. These books that he's writing, the last 12 verses of Mark, the revision revised, and so forth, are him speaking out about what happened, the, res the, the creation of a resulting, the, 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 com the critical text of Westcott and Hort, and its effect on the English Bible. Bergen was not what we would consider or call King James only. I would say he was traditional, a traditional text only guy. He did not like the changes that Westcott and Hort had made to the underlying Greek text and then the resulting implications of that when they took that text and translated it into English. Okay? All these books would have been available to uh, Brother Jordan in, before 1983. Philip Morrow. Which version, authorized or revised, from 1929, sorry, 24? Benjamin G. Wilkinson, Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, from 1930. Jasper James Ray, God Only Wrote One Bible, from 1955. Edward F. Hills, The King James Bible Defended, 1956, and Believing Bible Study, 1967. Peter S. Ruckman, The Bible Babel, that was his first book in 1964. Christian Handbook of Manuscript Evidence, 1970. The Monarch of the Books, 1973. Problem Texts, 1980. And Differences in the King James Version Editions, 1983. Now, my sense is that there are more titles from Ruckman that could be added to this list. Okay? He, he wrote a whole bunch of little teeny booklets. Uh, about a lot of stuff related to the King James Bible. Okay, um, Ruckman is uh, famous for his attitude. He is a very caustic, abrasive um, individual. Okay, so you have these books here by Ruckman. By the way, Brother Jordan spent time at Ruckman School. Uh, he got kicked out on account of his dispensational beliefs, but um, he did. He, he said he said he was interested in two things, learning two things from Ruckman. Number one was the manuscript evidence issues, and number two were the church history issues. Okay, but beyond that, once Ruckman found out where he was at dispensationally, he he gave him the boot um, on account of that. Yeah. Not to put you on the spot, but just curious, this Jasper James Ray guy only wrote one Bible. Do you know what the premise of that book is? <laughs> Um, I have that book. This is not one that I've gotten to reading specifically yet. I've read some stuff about it, and there is a there's a King James only position critic named Doug Kudelik. Okay, and one of the things that Kudelik says is that Ruckman's first book, The Bible Babel, is essentially a plagiarism of Jasper James Ray's God Only Wrote One Bible. Now, I'm still in the process of investigating that allegation to see if it's true, okay? But one thing, so the premise of that is, 
Why do we have all these different Bibles when God only wrote one? That's the basic premise. I know enough about the book to at least know that. I don't know all the details of every argument that he says. But that's basically, the, the title of the book is basically giving you the premise of the book. Mm -hmm. That why do we have all these different versions and so forth if God only wrote one Bible? Um, the thing that you need to be noticed, well, let me, I don't want to say that yet. Ward S. Allen. Now, I'm sure that some of you have heard of Bergen. Many of you, I believe, have heard of Ruckman. Some of you maybe have heard of Edward F. Hills, even. In a minute, I know all of you have heard of David Otis Fuller, <laughs> uh, especially given my covering the controversies he had with O'Hare in the Grace History Project. But probably the most outspoken individual or personality in this mix so far is Ruckman. Okay? Ward S. Allen is an interesting case. He is a professor from Great Britain that has studied, the, uh, done a lot with the documents that are, the surviving documents that are in the libraries at Oxford and Cambridge University. He is a bit more, um, if, if, if Ruckman is sort of a populist writer, writing for the, the masses, Ward S. Allen is definitely more of an academic writer, okay? So what that means is not as many people familiar with the, the issues related to the Bible issue or the King James Bible are familiar with Ward S. Allen as they are possibly some of these other names. But he wrote a book called Translating the King James. David Otis Fuller wrote a series of books in the 1970s. He wrote Which Bible in 1970, uh, 1970, True or False in 1973, and Counterfeit or Genuine in 1975. Okay. Wilbur, uh, William Pickering, or Wilbur Pickering, that's a, that's a typo, that should say Wilbur, not William. He wrote the identity of the New Testament text in 1977. Now, Pickering is not, Pickering is in favor, you should probably write this down, Pickering is a majority text proponent. Okay? He is not necessarily King, a King James Bible only proponent. Okay? He, his position is that the underlying text of the modern versions is corrupt and that the majority text is the better text, but he would not say that um, he would not say that the King James Bible is um, and again, using the word perfect, he would, he would not say that there are no errors in the King James Bible. And again, this is coming back to what Craig already brought up. How do you define an error? We'll get to all that stuff later on. Then 19, as a result of the writings of Ruckman and Fuller particularly, in 1979, D.A. Carson wrote the King James Version debate, A Plea for Realism. That's sort of the first, that's sort of the first book length work that was critical of the King James only position. D.A. Carson's book from 1979. In 1982, Zane Hodges and uh, Farstead released the Greek New Testament according to the majority text. Okay? So, Brother Jordan, so I'm on top of page four now. So, Brother Jordan taught manuscript evidence before any of the, of the significant works by the following King James supporters were authored. Okay? Sam Gipp, D.A. Waite, William P. Grady, Gail Ripplinger, Jack A. Mormon, Lawrence M. Vance, David W. Cloud, Joey Faust, R.B. Olette, is that how you say that, Nate? Yeah. Olette, uh, Thomas Holland, Jack McElroy, and many others. In addition, the first, in addition, the first edition of James R. White's book, The King James Only Controversy, Can You Trust the Modern Versions, did not appear in print until 1995. So, what do you gather from that? What you gather from that is after Brother Jordan finished the class, was there an explosion in King James only literature throughout the late 80s, into the 90s, and then into the, 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 new, the new millennium, if you will, okay? But a lot of these books by some of the big names, like Ripplinger and Waite, they were not in print when he was going through the material to create this class, okay? So, Ripplinger's first book doesn't appear until like 1992, almost 10 years later, after the fact. So even within the King James, even amongst those authors that are seeking to defend the King James Bible against modern versions, a great many of the writers that you would be familiar with or that would be available for you to read today were not available for you to read 
before 1983 when he started writing the class. Now, um, just because I'm kind of a, a moron and an idiot, I suppose, one of the things I'm interested in doing is creating an entire bibliography of all the books that are out there on this stuff. Okay? And putting everything, because I think you've got to be able to do that to fill in the blanks of who's saying what and when. All right? All right, any questions so far on this point? Yeah? So was Jordan just at the head of a wave of interest that was already going to occur, or did he kick off some of that? I do not think he is responsible for kicking it off. I think he is at the head of a growing wave that was building in the 80s of people that were beginning to see that that things were that there were significant differences in how the modern versions were reading as opposed to the the King James version and questions um, he certainly created a stir in the grace movement over this first that's absolutely true um, back go go back to that list just for a minute so go back to page three one of the things that I, as I'm putting all this stuff together, preparing for this, there's questions that I have that I want to answer. Okay, One of them is, when do you start really seeing an explosion in this literature? When it first starts. You see it at the beginning with, with Bergen, yeah, right? I mean, Horton Westcott. I mean, it wasn't an issue until just before Horton Westcott. And even then, I would argue it's largely an issue amongst academic academia, academic Christendom, if you will. Okay, it's not until it gets down to the popular level in the late '50s and 1960s that the average American church-going Christian really starts to lay aside the King James version to a large degree and take up the modern versions. That all this stuff becomes an issue. Okay. I'm not saying it didn't exist before that, because it did. But what you see is an explosion in the literature and an explosion in the discussion about it as the common everyday churchman, church-going person in, in the 50s and 60s starts to lay aside their King James Bible and pick up a modern version with the thinking that that's an advantage or better or more correct or more or whatever than what they had had before that. Okay. Um, so there, there's there's phenomenon here that I think need to be understood from a historical level as well. Yeah, Mike. But don't you think the, the neo-evangelical uh, movement of the uh, late '60s, early '70s, and finally into the came to a head? Yes. Where inerrancy was challenged. Yes. And finally, Linzel comes out with a book, a mainline editor of the Christianity Today magazine, the top magazine in the country, a readership of. Uh, of 600,000 people. You're talking about the battle for the Bible, yeah, for right? The Bible. Yep. Um, and Jordan would have been familiar with Yeah, that. I should have put that in the list. Uh, well, I'll do that and remind me to include it. We got the Council for Biblical Inerrancy, the Chicago Conference. Chicago Conference, yes, 1977. Out with books, uh, uh, on that. I should include, remind me to write that down too. I need to write down Geisler's book on inerrancy from 1980. Okay, don't forget Montgomery. What's, what was his one again? John Warwick Montgomery. What was the title of the book? Um, you remember? I, 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 check. I, I, you, I'm assuming you have it. I have it. Will you check and <laughs> will you check and tell me the title? A lot more too. All right. So that's that's the kind of stuff I need to know, right? I want because I want to create this in the end, have this sort of uh, this sort of <coughs> list. So you should have down Montgomery, Geisler. And um, what was the other one? Linzel. Linzel. Yeah, I have I have the Geisler one at home and the Linzel one at home. How do you spell Linzel? Just uh, I L I S D E L L. Is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Any other questions then? Okay. Amen. <laughs> Next point. I'm uh, back on page four. So, new discoveries were made in the 1960s and 70s at libraries in Great Britain. Notable discoveries include MS Manuscript 98. Okay, Manuscript 98 is a surviving manuscript from the work of one of the translating companies that worked on the King James Bible. Okay, another one is the notes of John Boyce. John Boyce took notes 
at the final reading of the King James Bible when they were, what they did, just very quickly, after all the companies had gone through their, their, their process, and I'll explain how all this went later on in the class, the last thing they did is they all sat in the room, somebody stood at a lectern, and they had the translation in front of them, and they read it out loud. And everybody sat and listened, and if, if somebody had an objection to the way something sounded, they would raise their hand, they would write it down, and they would discuss it. And then they would come to a consensus on what it should say. And John Boyce took notes on that process as they sat there and did that audible read. Okay, So obviously to have that is a big deal, right? Because it gives you a lot of insight, not only into the process they went through, but, but how they settled on some of the final readings of what the text should say in English. And then the third thing here is a document known as BOD 1602. BOD 1602 is a bound copy of a 1602 edition of the Bishop's Bible with handwritten notes by the translators in the margin. Okay, When the decision to translate was made, the King's printer printed something like 40, I believe. I might have that number wrong, but there were, there were a, a host of 1602 unbound, 1602 editions of the Bishop's Bible printed. Okay. The first rule given to the translators was that they needed to follow the text of the bishop's Bible unless the truth, unless the, the, the truth of the original said they should change it. So what this document is, is literally it's a bishop's Bible where, they took, where the translators took the pen, scratched out words, and wrote what they thought the reading should be in the margin. Okay, This stuff was discovered in these libraries in Great Britain in the late 60s and 70s. All right. These discoveries were studied throughout the 1970s with books explaining their significance first appearing one in the late 1970s and some others in the mid-90s. Published works explaining the significance of these findings were not well known outside academic circles in the early 1980s. So Brother Jordan may have known about it and he may not have, okay? And even if he knew it, there's still, there was a lot going on in the study of this. Ward S. Allen again, he wrote in 1977 a book called Translating the New Testament Epistles, 1604 to 1611. Now that's the same guy who wrote the book in um, 1969 about translating the King James Version. He also wrote a book, The Coming of the King James Gospels, a collation of the translator's work in progress. And that's what he's doing. He's explaining using the surviving historical documents that have now been studied exactly what they did. Okay. In the first half of the last decade, the OO decade, saw publication of two important works on the making of the King James Bible, as well as its linguistic and cultural impact upon the English-speaking world. These titles include Alistair McGrath, In the Beginning, The Story of the King James Bible and How It Changed a Nation, a Language, and a Culture, and also Adam Nicholson, God's Secretaries, The Making of the King James Bible from 2003. In 2004, Professor David Norton's groundbreaking, groundbreaking book, A Textual History of the King James Bible, was published by Cambridge Press. Moreover, Professor Norton's equally important, The King James Bible, A Short History from Tyndale to Today, was published in 2011 in commemoration of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Both of these works are indispensable to a complete understanding of the history of the King James text. Professor Norton has also written extensively on the subject of the Bible as literature in the following series of books. The History of the Bible as Literature, two volumes from 1993, and A History of the English Bible as Literature from 2000. Now, it's the book, the 2004 book, A Textual History of the King James Bible, that Craig handed to me in May 2011 and said, we got problems. I said, I know. We got lots of problems. <laughs> but what he was talking about was the fact that what Professor Norton had done is he'd gone through every edition of the King James Bible. And what he concluded was that there were textual differences between the editions that were greater than simply updating in spelling and changes in punctuation. Okay? Now the reason that's a problem is because that historically the King James position had said that the only differences between the editions were updates, updates in spelling and changes in punctuation. Well, guess what? Lo and behold, that wasn't true. 
So I don't know how many times did I call you? I probably called you every day for about four months <laughs> as I'm reading this book and trying to figure out what it means. And I think you were frustrated. He was frustrated with me for a while because I wasn't seeing the point that he was trying to make. And then when I finally saw the point, what I realized is we need to, we need to, we need to define inerrancy in a way that makes sense and that's in line with sort of the uh, textual and historical facts. Okay, So that's one reason why this book needs to be updated and expanded and, and, and so on because it's... it's it's sort of old thinking on my part and not, not, not representative of sort of, you know, what I've come to think and believe since then, okay? And it all comes back to how do you define these things? Look, if I'm going to demand exact sameness, go turn, turn in your Bible to Jude. The 1611 edition of the King James Bible. To the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and what? Both now and ever. Okay? The 1611 says, now and what? Ever. Period. What you have in your lap is a 1769 edition, and what does it say? Both what? Now and ever. Okay? Now, according to what I was taught, is this a different reading than this? Is there an extra word here that wasn't there? Yes. Is this an updating in spelling? No. Is this an updating in punctuation? No. No. So there's a word that's in this one that's not where? So if I'm going to say that the Bible has to be verbatim, exact, word for word, to be inerrant, you see the problem? Which one of these is the inerrant one then? The meaning is the same. Okay, now you're getting ahead of me, okay? <laughs> but the point is... Does anybody have the right to does anybody have the authority to say which one of these is the inerrant one? No. Do they convey the exact same meaning? Yes. If I so if I say now and ever, that's the same thing as saying both now and what? If my, my two sons are sitting back there, and I used to I've used this illustration before. If I throw the ball, if I throw the ball to Andrew and Daniel. Is that the same thing as saying, I threw the ball to both Andrew and Daniel? Yep. Is there any difference in the meaning? No. What if I say I threw the ball to Andrew? That's different. Okay. So what Craig and I, working together, concluded is that you should not demand exact sameness as your definition of inerrancy because that just paints you into a corner, right? The issue is... So why then does a modern version err? To me, a modern version err because the words are changed so much that they change the underlying what? Meaning. Meaning. Okay. So if, if this said, if this said, um, what if it just said this? That's different. Is that different? Yeah. That's different, right? So there's a lot of stuff that we got to think through here. All right, but the book there, by the, the material by David Norton, which by the way, there's a link to this whole text of this entire book on the church website if you want to go look at it. It's an expensive book. To get a hard copy of it, it's going to cost you almost $100 or more on Amazon. Okay. So in addition, I'm at the bottom of page four. In addition, 2011 saw a flurry of scholarly works published in, in commemoration of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. 
There is much in these books that needs to be taken into account when considering this subject matter. A sampling of the titles includes Donald Brake, A Visual History of the King James Bible. These are all from 2011. David Crystal, Begat, The King James Bible in the English Language. Leland Rankin, The Legacy of the King James Bible. John M. Sweeney, Verily, Verily, The KJV, 400 Years of Influence and Beauty. And David Thames, Majesty, The King Behind the King James Bible. And then just this year, earlier this year, in 2015, Lawrence M. Vance published the results of his collation comparing the text of the Bishop's Bible New Testament with the King James New Testament in the making of the King James New Testament. Okay, So what's my point in going over all this stuff? Well, in short, a class on the King James Bible that takes into account the latest research on the subject, in my opinion, is long overdue. Okay. And again, this is not in any way to criticize what Brother Jordan did. Okay, I think what Brother Jordan did was a masterful job given the information that was available to him 30 years ago. That's not my point. My point is not to criticize that. My point is just to say that there's a lot more things that are relevant to this issue that are out there now that were not necessarily known in 1983 when the class started. Okay. Any other questions? Now look, if you're going to ask me to dig dr drill deep right now into the inerrancy issue, I'm not going to do that yet. We will do that, not now. Okay? Yeah? Just briefly, who's David Norton? What's his background? David Norton is a professor at um, Queen's College in New Zealand. Oh. I have exchanged emails with him. I've exchanged about seven or eight emails with him in May and June of this year. Um, working, I've actually, he helped me and I actually ended up helping him put together some chronology about what was going on with the English Bible from 1585 to 1604. He had some stuff in one of his books that was unclear to me, so I wrote him and asked him a question about it. And he wrote me back, and I said, well, wait a minute, what you're saying here doesn't seem to fit with this. And so we discussed it back and forth, and uh, we, we kind of came to some understandings about, and it, and it relates to the timing, Mike, of a piece of a draft. There was a draft of Parliament that was presented during Queen Elizabeth's reign before she died in the middle, in the middle 1590s, that would have authorized a retranslation of the English Bible some 10 years, give or take, before King James author authorized in 1604. See, nobody knows about that because it's never, it's, it, it's, it hasn't been, it hasn't been studied and brought out as a, as a um, relevant issue. So there's all sorts of things like that that are out there that need to be talked about as far as how they relate to how you should think about all this stuff. Okay. But Norton, yeah, he's uh, he's an interesting he's an interesting guy. His books are clear, are absolutely worth reading, and in my opinion, they are completely indispensable to any conversation about this moving forward. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Fourth, I have concluded that historically, or at least since the 1950s. The articulation of the King James position has been dominated by Acts 2 Baptists who not only disapprove of our dispensational position mid-Acts, but in some cases actually believe things about the King James Bible that are detrimental to the position. Now, I don't mean that to be mean and ugly and nasty to the Baptists. Okay, That's not what I'm after here. It's just a point. It's a fact. Okay, all Of all the names on that list, David Otis Fuller, Peter Ruckman, um, a, a lot of the big names in the King James only, uh, William P. Grady, Sam Gipp, um, Gail Ripplinger, they're, 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 all, they're all Baptists. They come from Baptist churches, and to the Baptist credit, they, more than any other Christian denomination, have taken a stand on this issue. Okay, they, that's, that's also a fact that can't be ignored. Um, somebody on the King James only debate group that I'm a wallflower on, somebody published a list of King James only churches in the United States. I don't think it's a complete list at all because we weren't on there. Um, but 
98% of the churches on the list, as you go state by state through the list that the guy put on there, were all Baptist churches. Okay? Um, consequently, I have come to believe that it is incumbent upon Pauline dispensationalists to forge and advance our own position on the King James Bible that is in line and consistent with both the historical and textual facts as well as our dispensational beliefs regarding God's working in time. Okay? So, I'm a King James Bible believer. I believe the King James Bible is God's word for English-speaking people. It was translated from the preserved, preserved and proper text, the Receptus, using the proper method of literal equivalency. I'm also a mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalist who believes some very specific things regarding God's working in time during the dispensation of grace. God is at work in the world today in the lives of His saints through His written word. God is not necessarily physically intervening like He did in time past, excuse me, with Israel. I further maintain that what we believe about one, the Bible, ought not to conflict with what we believe about the other, God's working in time and the dispensation of grace. Doctrinal consistency is very important and should be sought after diligently. Herein lies a unique problem for those who are King James Bible believers and mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalists. Historically, the King James position has been championed most visibly and vocally by Acts 2 dispensationalists who vehemently oppose our dispensational position. Okay? Consequently, much has been said in pro-King James literature that is not only inconsistent with our dispensational position specifically, but is also detrimental to an accurate enunciation of the King James position in general. If asked, I would be hard-pressed to think of even one book on the King James position that I could recommend to somebody without reservation or equivocation. The available literature on the matter is full of doctrinal problems of a dispensational matter, documentation problems, plagiarism, ad hominem attacks, or tabloid style sensationalism. It is. If you've read it, it's true. Mike, is it true? Craig, is it true? It is. Okay? Just a fact. Some of you, uh, Ron, I believe you have a uh, King James Version defended, defined Bible, right? Defined, yeah. Defined, yeah. So it's got definitions in there to help you understand the archaic words. Gail Ripplinger has an entire booklet out there about how that is an apostate Bible because D.A. Waite got all of his definitions from Strong's Concordance. That's the kind of stuff we're dealing with here. Okay? In my opinion, none of that is what? None of it's helpful. None of it's relevant in my opinion. Okay? But that's, that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with. So, it's my prayer that the time we spend together studying these issues will be productive to these ends, i.e. the forging of a position that is dispensationally and historically accurate, but also dispensationally correct. Okay, I think I read that wrong. Doctrinally and historically accurate, but also dispensationally correct. So the four reasons for doing it. Number one, your questions. Number two, the emphasis of the board on training faithful men in the assembly. Okay. Number three, new information that is relevant, that has been uh, studied and written about in the last 30 years. And four, the desire to want to state a position on this issue that is free of all of the funny business that, that fills up a lot of the books and material and writing that's taken place on these issues. Okay? So before we move on, that I can't believe that took 50 minutes. Before we move on to the next point, anybody have any questions or comments? It would help if I took the cap off the water. <laughs> all right. Personal history. I should be able to go through this pretty quick. So, I grew up reading the King James Bible, okay? When I went to Awana, as a kid, all the verses I memorized in Awana were from a King James Bible. This was before Awana gave you the option to use a modern version, okay? I don't know when that changed, but it was after I was done with Awana. How many, I'm assuming most of you know who what Awana is, right? Bible memory program and stuff. Approved working or not changed. Yeah. But they, they don't really divide. <laughs> no, they, they didn't. So, from very early after his salvation, my father, Steve Ross, came to understand and appreciate that there were more differences between the King James Bible and a modern version than just an updating of wording. Okay? 
So for a time in the 1970s, my father contemplated attending Peter Ruckman's Pensacola Bible Institute in Pensacola, Florida. He actually traveled there, met Ruckman, and visited the school at one point, and decided against attending there on account of the vicious uh, slash radical spirit that he saw in Ruckman's followers. So if there was ever a good thing he decided to do in his early Christian life, it was not go to Ruckman school. Amen. <clears throat> While I grew up using the King James Bible, I'm sorry, in the mid-1980s, my father attended Gray School of the Bible where he took Brother Jordan's manuscript evidence class. This class served to buttress his long-held preference and affinity for the King James Bible, thereby turning it into a personal conviction. He had a preference, he had a personal, but he had, a, you know, well, I think this is the best one, but after going through the material and manuscript evidence, he came out the other side believing that, no, this is God's Word for English-speaking people. So while I grew up using the King James Bible throughout my formative years in the 1990s, I had no real understanding of the reasons why my father advocated for its exclusive use. I knew that the NIV and other modern versions took out the blood of Christ in Colossians 1.14. Uh, I, I know I had been exposed to more teaching on the subject, but either didn't pay attention, didn't understand, or didn't retain it. All right? I thought back some more. I know that they, changed, they took out the word dispensation and they did some other things, but I didn't really know what was going on. I, didn't, I couldn't really say what was going on. Okay. Um, I also saw on my dad's bookshelf uh, Gail Ripplinger's New Age versions, and beyond that, I really never questioned anything. I just I used it. That's what I knew. That's what I used. I knew he used it. That was about it. It was not until I arrived at Grace Bible College in the fall of 1996 that I really began to have questions regarding the King James Version, the King James versus Modern Versions debate. In the summer of 19, 1997, that was after my freshman year, I picked up a copy of Gail Ripplinger's New Age Versions at the Grace School of Bible Family Bible Conference and read it before going back to school for my sophomore year. In the summer of 1997, I also enrolled in Grace School of Bible, <clears throat> while at the same time being a student at uh, Grace Bible College. During my second year, I also picked up a few other titles, the King James Bible Defended by Dr. Edward F. Hills and Witch Bible by David Otis Fuller. <clears throat> that fall, still 1997, I began receiving the videos from Grace School of Bible and watching them in the basement of GBC's library. It was then that I began inhaling the Manuscript Evidence and Fundamentals of dispensational, Dispensationalism classes. At this time, in my second, in this time, at this time, in my second year theology class, we were learning about Westcott and Hort's text, uh, theory of textual criticism and the alleged superiority of the critical text and its resultant modern versions over the traditional text of the Textus Receptus and the King James Bible. So it just so happened that when I started to receive the videos from Grace School of Bible and started going through this material on manuscript evidence, it was at almost exactly the time that we were talking about this in the second year theology class. Okay? So I was literally hearing what they said, listening to what he said, sometimes on the same day. Once in the morning from, from my professor and later in the evening on the VHS tape from the school. So I was, I, was, I mean, that, that's how closely together some of this stuff overlapped. Okay? Where did I leave off? It was very oh, it was a very exciting time for me to be able to study both theories at virtually the same time. By the end of my sophomore year, spring 1998, I had, a length, I had a lengthy study, after a lengthy study of the issues, I became convinced that the King James Bible was God's word for English-speaking people. So at that point, that became my view, not my dad's. Okay? So in other words, I made the mental ascent to take ownership of that as what I believe for myself, not just what my father taught me. All right? My acceptance and advocacy of the King James position was not popular at school and caused many problems throughout the duration of my stay at Grace Bible College. While I was neither threatened with expulsion over the issue, never threatened with expulsion over the issue, I was called before the president of the college on more than one occasion to answer various false allegations that had been made against me by members of the student body. Okay, I did. <laughs> Since embracing the King James position, I have taught and preached from it exclusively and promoted its superiority over all modern versions. Over the years, further study of the position has revealed that, tweak, that tweaking my thinking on the matter was in order. 
Most notably, on the inerrancy issue that I addressed in 2011 at the, at the Summer Family Conference. Okay? More recently, my commitment to the King James Bible has been called into question by some on the count of the fact that I dared consider the underlying Greek in addressing the joint heir controversy of Romans 8.17. Some have accused me of having an indecent agenda, of seeking to infect Grace School the Bible with the Greek games and modern version leaven of Grace Bible College. Not only are ad hominem attacks such as these ignorant of the facts of my personal history, they also highlight a growing trend in some Grace circles of calling into question one's commitment to the King James Bible in the face of doctrinal disagreement. Folks, it's a trend beyond doubt in my mind that what is happening is if there's a, if there's a, if there's a doctrinal disagreement between two people, one side is going to go after the other side and say, well, the reason for this is you're not King James enough. Okay? Why would you do that? To, to go after somebody on that issue, to me, is like picking the low-hanging fruit from a tree. Okay, Because what you're trying to do, is instead of really addressing the real issues of what's being said, you're trying to cause doubt in the mind of the listener about somebody's, about somebody's uh, belief and character without really addressing what they're actually teaching. Okay? This, I, and I've seen this done now over the last 10 years or so with at least four different issues. All right? So, that's where I'm coming from in this. I had a meeting in, two, in the spring of 2013. I had a meeting with the president of Grace Bible College. Some of you know about this. Um, I per my I th this is my personal private subjective opinion. Okay? I believe that there was conversation started by Dr. DeWitt about the possibility of offering me a faculty position on account of the Grace History Project. The first question I was asked was are you King James only? I said yes, that ended that ended it right there. I mean, he was nice to me, he was respectful to me, we had a conversation about it, but I knew that there was no way he was ever going to offer me a position. Yeah, Norm? Would they really, like when you were in school and they, they approached you on your, your view, do you think they would really do that with anybody today? I don't know. I don't know. I just, just... <clears throat> so, my, my, my point in saying that is just that th this, is a, this is a conviction and a commitment that I have that I'm not willing to, to say, even to the professor of a school, that I believe something I don't believe about it just so that I can have some um, perceived position of authority. Okay? Um, I don't mean to say he was, it was a cordial conversation. There wasn't any ugliness or nastiness. But I just know that that was, that was a game breaker for him. That was a deal breaker for him. He wasn't going to have some nutball King James only guy on the faculty of a school. Okay? It just wasn't going to fly. All right, we well, all right. I just want to cover this list of topics and we'll quit. So, given my experience with the Grace History Project, I have I hesitate to even publish any type of course outline. <laughs> all right. I know that what I think the class will be now at the outset will change as we move through the material. That being said, I also know that not everyone will find all the material I plan on covering of equal benefit or interest. Consequently, I plan on doing shorter terms devoted to specific topics that will allow students on the internet to only study through those terms or information that they deem important or interesting. So I'm going to do a term on inspiration. Then we're going to take a break and then we'll do a term on preservation and, and so on. Okay, And so I'm going to try to group the material together in groupings of information that makes sense. All right, Topics I plan on including here, recovering, include inspiration, preservation, canonicity, the transmission of the text, the formation of the textus receptus, pre-1611 English translations as rough drafts of the King James Bible, po the political climate leading up to the decision to translate, the state of the English language at the time of the translation, the translation process, 
the textual history of the King James Bible, the reception and political implications of the translation, the cultural and linguistic impact, the Westcott, Westcott and Horton, the formation of the critical text, the critical text and modern versions, Dean Bergen's objection to the critical text, the formation of the doctrine of inerrancy, and if uh, all goes well and the rapture doesn't happen, we're going to cover the entire history and historiography of the King James Only movement. Okay? What? I don't know how long it's going to take, but... <laughs> this is ideally, of course, on paper what I want to do, right? So, logistically, things have changed for me somewhat at work that you need to be aware of. I have had to take on some new responsibilities, so consequently I'm giving myself the freedom to take a week off from class if I need it. Okay? If I, if I need a week off, I'm going to say I, that we won't have class next week because I just can't, I don't have time to put forth the lesson. Okay? Now, I don't anticipate that being a regular thing. But I'm just saying to you that it might have to happen from time to time. And I want you to be aware of it. The other thing is that what I do bring from time to time might not be an hour and five minutes. Which most of you probably be okay with that. Okay? And then last, I've also created a website that will serve as an online extension of the class. As I did with the Grace History Project, I plan on uploading all the video, audio, PDF notes, and PowerPoint files to the From This Generation Forever website and then there you have the, the address that you can find the website at. Okay. So that's the introduction. Good. Next week we'll start Term 1, Lesson 1, getting, beginning the study of inspiration. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>